Thank you for coming in on a, on a beautiful day. We're ready for a fun event. Uh, and before I introduce today's guests, because I know you all have no idea who's coming up here, I'd like to tell you about two special upcoming events. Uh, on Sunday, November 10th at 4 o'clock, we will have best-selling author and physicist Fritjof Kopra. He will be talking about his new book, Learning from Leonardo. And that event kicks off the convergence. It's a week of events celebrating Tech Awards laureates being in town. So that's a big deal here. Another event the same week is the Summit. That's Wednesday, November 13th, 4.30 in the Hackworth IMAX Dome Theater. Tickets are 10 o'clock for that event. We'd like to offer our guests, that would be you, our TechNet guests, complimentary tickets. At the Summit, you will meet 10 extraordinary Tech Award laureates who are using technology to benefit humanity. And uh, Elizabeth Hausler, a past laureate, who's the CEO of Build Change, and you'll also meet Brian Goffrefar, a remarkable 18-year-old who has the distinction of being the youngest college student to raise $1 million for her company, Entify. Uh, reception in the upstairs gallery follows the summit, and if you'd like to talk to Leslie to find out how to receive free tickets to the summit, we'd like to have you as our guests. Uh, do we have Leslie here so you know who you're looking for? I'll point her out to you before we get to this. She'll be the woman you need to talk to about those tickets. Uh, the Tech is the last stop for the traveling exhibit, Star Wars, where science meets imagination. Tickets are available online, or you can stop at the ticket counter in the lobby right outside. And continue with our Star Wars theme, on Sunday, December 15th, we'll host a conversation with Lauren Peterson about the Star Wars model shop. And right now, I'd like to remind you to turn off all the sounds and beeps and whirs on your cell phone. We'd love to have you tweet about our event with the hashtag, the Tech Connects. And uh, if you do need to leave early, we'd rather you not leave out these doors. There's no way to do that without making a fuss. So if you go behind the curtain, if you get called to leave early, you can leave much uh, less disruptively. And we want to make you part of today's event and today's conversation. So you all found cards on your seat when you came in today. You can use those cards to write down your question at any point during the conversation and hold it up and one of our volunteers will pick up that card. And when we get to the Q&A at the end of the conversation, we'll start incorporating as many of your questions and comments as we can into our conversation. So let us talk about Steve. <laughs> Born and educated in Philadelphia, uh, Steve Sansweet majored, majored in journalism. He was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal's Philadelphia and Montreal bureaus. He became their LA bureau chief until 1996 and then became director of specialty marketing at Lucasfilm Limited. His title later changed to director of content management and head of fan relations. Steve has written or co-authored 18 books, 16 of those on Star Wars, and he's currently president and CEO of Rancho Obi-Wan Inc., a nonprofit corporation using the collection to educate and inspire. His book, Star Wars, The Ultimate Action Figure Collection, is on sale in the tech store, and he will be happy to sign those later. Part of the reason he's here. So please welcome Steve Zansweet. I don't know about you guys, but I want to meet that college student who raised a million dollars for her company, because I could use the help. Um, before geek culture conquered the world, we fans were misunderstood a lot. You know, it wasn't that long ago, after having been a journalist for 30 years, that I sat through interviews around the world where I was called a nerd, fanatic, loony, a cultist, nutter, and even an anorak. Now, that's a British slang term that turned the typical hooded windbreaker worn by train spotters into a somewhat derogatory term for fans, obsessive fans. Now, granted, folks who spend hours at a windy train station writing down times and details of all the trains that come through might seem a bit compulsive to some people. But, you know, my response was usually to compare myself to the most obsessive fan of whatever the most popular sport was in that country, usually soccer or, or footy or, in Canada, curling, I don't know, strange things. Now, fandom is all about popular culture, mass media, and the ability to instantly connect with like-minded others. Something that couldn't have been imagined when science fiction and comic book fans first started small get-togethers in the late 1930s. You know, fandom got a brief moment in the media spotlight in the late 1960s when the rumor went around 
that the Star Trek series was going to be canceled by NBC after two seasons. And there was this massive letter writing campaign um, by fans. But I would make a very strong case that it was the 1977 release of Star Wars that jump-started geek culture in the last decades of the 20th century. Now, you would probably expect me to say that since, as you've heard, I was head of fan relations for Lucasfilm for 15 years, and I'm still fan relations advisor. Now, in that time, I've seen geeks reclaim that word as a proud affirmation of our strength and our buying power after decades of being sneered at and kept on the sidelines. You know, I'm proud to have been part of the forward edge of this new fandom and what I would argue is the biggest worldwide pop culture phenomenon in the last 50 years, Star Wars. I grew up at the dawn of the space age Add to that a lifelong love of science fiction from authors such as Asimov and Heinlein to the cheesy TV shows like Tom Corbett's Space Cadet. So I guess my path might seem somewhat predictable. In late 1976, I was a reporter in the Los Angeles Bureau of the Wall Street Journal when I started collecting space toys like the 1960s tin battery operated and wind up Japanese robots and versions of world, real world capsules like you know, the Mercury and the Apollo and the Atlas rockets. But there had been little in the mass media to get me excited with the possible exceptions of three seasons of Star Trek on TV and a few movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey. And then along came George Lucas and his space opera, a western set amidst the stars, a fantasy that didn't obey the rules and restrictions of hard science fiction. And I was hooked. I got to see it about 10 days before it opened and all the hype started. Um, it was in a theater on the back lot of 20th Century Fox and it was filled with journalists from Los Angeles and their kids. And while that was an experience, I still remember. Unlike today's so-called tentpole movies, there wasn't much merchandise in advance of the film. And even for months afterwards, as its popularity just swept the US and then worldwide, it was truly a case of the merchandise following the pent-up demand as Star Wars basically launched the business of licensing products for motion pictures. The strong desire to take something Star Wars home with you and having to wait seemed to make everything even that much dearer. When small action figures and vehicles finally started showing up in the stores about nine months after Star Wars appeared, kids finally had a way to recreate scenes from the movies and then develop their own play patterns. I mean, you know, you can battle Han Solo versus Luke Skywalker and have lots of fun. Make up your own imaginative reworking of Star Wars. And home video at that point was still several years in the future. While Star Wars had been below the radar for most, including those who booked movies into theaters, a fan community star for something unique and cool had already been let in on the secret. Out of desperation and inspiration, a guy named Charlie Lippincott, who was Lucasfilm's head of marketing, publicity, and merchandising, and a comic book and sci-fi geek himself brought photos and even props and costumes to several fan conventions in 1976, a year before the movie opened. A paperback novelization of the story that was sort of quietly released in November 1976 sold out all 500,000 copies 
And Marvel Comics issued the first three of its six movie adaptation issues prior to the May 25th, 1977 opening. So the target audience knew, and those early lines around the block at the just 32 theaters that had booked Star Wars in the US ignited a media firestorm. May the force be with you. How many times and how many different situations has that phrase been used? Millions? Billions? When a line from a film goes from screen to memory without pausing long enough to become a cliche, that's more than entertainment. That's the very essence of popular culture. And popular culture is one of the few things these days that gives us all at least a little shared identity. It provides a shortcut to understanding, making the punchline of a joke funny without some sort of laborious explanation. The Star Wars generation, those of us who grew up or matured with Star Wars on the brain, has been impressed not only with the great visuals, the characters, the story, but also with the dialogue, the funny lines along with the philosophical ones. Oh, critics have carped and called it cheesy, but why have so many of those lines had such long staying power? In fact, they keep springing up under some of the most unlikely circumstances. I can remember walking with a friend to uh, where my car was parked in a dark lot in a fairly seedy area of San Francisco, and I couldn't help muttering, I've got a bad feeling about this. <laughs> or searching for inspiration at the computer keyboard, I have been known to say to myself, Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. What is it about these movies that has had such staying power and popularity that the public consistently votes one or the other of them as their favorite movie in poll after poll? The college marching bands play the Imperial March when their defensive unit runs out onto the field during football games. That editorial cartoonist for three decades now have used Darth Vader as a stand-in for evil of all sorts during the Cold War of the Soviet Union and since then, oh, Dick Cheney. <laughs> Star Wars has captured the hearts and imaginations of millions of people worldwide, largely because the saga celebrates heroism and the limitless potential of the individual. The saga engages us, it excites us, it inspires us, but most of all it's about fun, the collective fun experienced by audiences around the world. The movies are so vast in scope and rich with original characters, vehicles, worlds, that they engage us with the thrill of emotional discovery. As many of you know, George Lucas didn't set out to make Star Wars. The man who turned one of his student films into a mostly bleak look at the future in THX 1138 for Warner Brothers, and then followed with the hugely successful American graffiti for Universal Studios, had originally wanted to do a new Flash Gordon film with the sensibility of the Saturday matinee serials that played in movie theaters before he was even born, but that he watched when they came to television in the 1950s when he was growing up. Lucky for us, King Feature Syndicates, which held the rights to Flash Gordon, turned him down. So in the early 1970s, George set out to make his own space fantasy. By May 1973, he had completed a 13-page treatment, or a plot summary, filled with these strange names and places and ideas, many of which would either never make the final film or would make it in different sorts of ways. Despite having one of the top entertainment attorneys in Hollywood and the huge success of American Graffiti, both 
graffiti's distributor Universal and another studio, United Artists, passed on what was then known as the adventure of the Star Killer. I probably would have too. Undaunted, George Lucas kept working on full-blown drafts of his screenplay, eventually completing four of them. In the summer of 1975, he enlisted the aid of an aerospace artist, Ralph McQuarrie, and told him to pick half a dozen or so scenes to illustrate, to help give the studio bigwigs some idea of what the movie was all about, something more than just what was on paper. Actually, 20th Century Fox production head Alan Ladd Jr. Um, acting like his uh, cowboy actor star father before him had ridden to the rescue by signing a deal memo with George two years before based on the screening of American Graffiti and a detailed discussion about what would become Star Wars. But a nervous and somewhat perplexed Fox board of directors still had to approve the funding for this very strange film. So Lucas and his producer, Gary Kurtz, wanted to be well prepared. Macquarie was hired, and in less than three weeks, he came up with scores of rough sketches that he turned into five sweeping painted panoramas capturing the true feel of the film. The art was a key to getting Star Wars past its final hurdle. It gave the Fox directors some confidence that a film populated with weird characters and bizarre settings actually could be made. But the saga is so much more. Mary Henderson, who was the original curator for the first major Star Wars museum show, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum's Magic of Myth exhibit, put the making of Star Wars into its proper perspective this way. When the first film in the original trilogy appeared in 1977, the ancient myths no longer seemed relevant for many people in this culture. Pressing present day problems absorbed our attention and hope itself seemed in short supply. The economy was on the downswing. The recently ended Vietnam conflict had left no clear victory and many troubling issues in its wake. The Cold War continued and Watergate had instilled a profound disillusionment with government in the minds of many Americans, much like today. Even the space program, which had symbolized American spirit of discovery and adventure when President John F. Kennedy announced that he was going to send man to the moon in the early 1960s, even that had stalled. Here is a culture that clearly needed new stories to inspire it and instruct it. Stories that would speak to modern concerns and at the same time offer some timeless wisdom. So wrote Mary Henderson. Now, many react to the Star Wars saga on some visceral level because of its strong and universal mythological underpinnings. The hero's journey the call to adventure, the wise and helpful guide, the magic talisman, the hero partners, the mystical insight, the rescue of the princess, although in this case one who really doesn't need rescue, even slaying the dragon, you know, job of the hut. All of those and much, much more are part of the classic mythology yet are also part of the Star Wars mythos. Did George Lucas set out to do that deliberately? Oh yeah. He felt strongly that the trend of movies in the 1970s had been towards the dark and the depressing. Few audience films were being made like the westerns of the 40s and the 50s, which created a certain mythology of their own, especially for a younger generation. Lucas had been introduced in college to the works of mythologist Joseph Campbell, someone who was to become one of his mentors. I was trying to make a certain mythological principles and apply them to the story, George said in an interview, 
Ultimately, I had to abandon that and just simply write the story. And I found that when I went back and read it and then started applying it against the sort of principles that I was trying to work with originally, they were all there. It just that I didn't put them in consciously. So it was George's subconscious after absorbing all the mythology that sort of led to a lot of what Star Wars is today. There really is something primal about these films and whatever it is that audiences bring to them, the movies affect the larger percentage of viewers on a deeper and longer lasting basis than most other films. The writer Andrew Gordon wrote in something called Literature and Film Quarterly that each generation much, must either create its own myths and its own heroes or regenerate those of the past. Star Wars, as I have said, was released in a period when there were a few heroes, thanks to Vietnam and Watergate, when the lines between good and evil had become very blurred, when sexual identities were beginning to be redefined. Many Americans found themselves living in a world drained of spiritual values, a world in which the individual felt impotent. In the 1970s, Americans desperately needed a renewal of faith in themselves as good guys on the world scene, as human beings who counted. Old superheroes like Superman were revived, and so were old-fashioned films like Rocky and Star Wars. Such fantasies give voice to our deepest longings and speak to our hopes about the future of society and of ourselves. For example, in opposing the dehumanizing use of technology, Star Wars shows the triumph of good over evil machinery. But I'll tell you what hooked me personally in the first film. It's a scene without words. Luke Skywalker gets up from the dinner table in frustration, desperately wanting to leave his dusty, barren planet behind and he walks up to a small hill, casting his eyes heavenward towards the twin suns. Meanwhile, some of John Williams' most plaintive music builds in the background. I could taste Luke's yearning. His need to get away from his home and establish himself as his own person. I so related to that. For Luke, the hero's journey was about to begin. For me, I was already on mine. But at that point, I didn't know how either one was going to end. George Lucas had no way of knowing whether Star Wars was going to be, oh, maybe a moderate success, a big boulder in his path, or even at certain points, a career ender. The British crew that made it and much of the cast thought it was a piece of nonsensical trash. Lucas was exhausted and barely got all of the special effects shots that he needed done in time. Certainly, no one could have predicted the incredible audience reaction as Star Wars swept America by storm in the summer of 1977. The very success of the film and the quickly spread word that there would be at least two sequels was another contributing factor leading Star Wars to pop culture icon status. Magazines which had mostly ignored the film before competed for interviews with the actors. Photos were everywhere. Rock radio stations played the classical style soundtrack by demand and a disco version was quickly rushed out. For kids, there was little else to talk about on the playground or at summer camp, and certainly back at school in the fall. And having another Star Wars movie in a couple of years kept the topic alive. Another major factor in the Star Wars phenomenon was the arrival a few years later of home video, which helped to create new fans, those who had been too young to see the films when they were originally on the big screen. And youngsters viewing patterns often mimic those of hardcore Star Wars fans. What do kids do when they see something on video that they like? They watch it again and again 
and again. But talk on the playground and continually rewatch videos weren't the only things the saga had going for it. Star Wars as a pop culture icon owns nearly as much, I think, to its ubiquitous merchandising as anything else. Star Wars jump-started the slow-growing licensing business and was responsible for the now-taken-for-granted licensing of major movies for products ranging from novels and trading cards to toys and clothing. That just hadn't existed before Star Wars. In fact, according to the licensing letter, prior to the release of Star Wars in May 1977, consumers worldwide spent less than $5 billion a year at retail for licensed merchandise. Today, that figure is well over $120 billion. The outreach to and the inclusion of the fan community was also essential to the saga's success. In fact, that became part of Lucasfilm's DNA decades before the Hollywood studios caught on. There was an internally run fan club and newsletter, giveaways and contests, and active communications between company representatives and fans. Soon after Return of the Jedi was released in 1983, that all faded away. It wasn't until Lucasfilm was getting ready to release the special editions for the 20th anniversary of the original trilogy before launching the prequel movies that the fan machinery kicked into gear again. And I was part of it. I did have a head start. Besides that continuing growth of my Star Wars collection, <clears throat> I had interviewed George Lucas for a column in the Wall Street Journal on the 10th anniversary of the first movie's release. In the early 1990s, Lucasfilm started a publishing unit, and I heard through the grapevine that it was planning to do a collectibles price guide. So I made a cold call to the new head of publishing and basically said that if anybody was to do such a book, it should be me. And you are who? <laughs> Came the answer on the other end of the line. But that call led to my first Star Wars book, From Concept to Screen to Collectible, which traced the movie from an idea in George's head to how it got put on the screen to then the merchandising. Since then, I've written 15 more Star Wars books, including two encyclopedias. The QVC Home Shopping Network had me on as a guest for one of its Star Wars collector shows in the mid-1990s, and I ended up as co-host for the next six years, more than 60 hours of live TV selling Star Wars stuff. <laughs> I had been Los Angeles bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal for nearly nine years, and it was time to do something else, either at the Journal or elsewhere. So when I got a call from Lucasfilm soliciting my advice as to who they could hire for a guaranteed one year only, guaranteed one year only job at minimal pay, uh, to go to a bunch of fan conventions and let fans in on some of the secrets of the special editions, <laughs> naturally I took the plunge. Um, I took Joseph Campbell's advice, follow your bliss. And then they forgot to get rid of me after a year. <laughs> I looked at myself as being Lucasfilm's representative to the fans, but just as important, fandom's representative inside Lucasfilm. This wasn't a once a year, let's set up a booth at, uh, and have a celebrity panel at San Diego Comic Con kind of thing. Rather, it was let's make our fans as happy as possible, partners in Star Wars. And if we can't do something, or if there's a bothersome issue, let's try to explain why. You know, getting corporate buy-in on a newly formed group wearing Star Wars costumes called the 501st Legion was just one example of how understanding fans and their motives can pay huge dividends in the long run. For me, working inside Lucasfilm while three new Star Wars films were being made and marketed was an incredibly exciting second career. But honestly, the best part of the job was traveling around the world, speaking before tens of thousands of fans and getting to become close friends with a lot of them. The sense of community, of sharing, of caring, has been truly life-changing. 
Now I find myself chief executive of Rancho Obi-Wan, a nonprofit museum that displays my personal collection, estimated at more than 300,000 pieces. We just made the Guinness World Records 2014 book as the world's largest collection of Star Wars memorabilia. Duh. <laughs> and there's some cards over there on that table that you can pick up afterwards that tell you a little bit about Rancho Obi-Wan. Giving personal two to three hour tours to small groups let me share so many stories that have built up over the years and also to make new friendships. Um, George Lucas created a large enough sandbox for millions of fans to play in. How exciting it, it is to realize that the Star Wars gene is going to be passed along to future generations as new Star Wars movies are made and more fans get to share the experience of that faraway galaxy with their children and grandchildren. And that bodes well for fans of every stripe. Seeing a largely female audience in the thousands lined up outside for a day in advance to see and hear a Comic-Con panel with stars from the Twilight films finally shattered Hollywood's delusion that there weren't any girl geeks. Ugh, girls like science fiction and fantasy too. Superhero comics will soon be entering their eighth decade and the high grossing and often pretty good movies being made from them provide hope for their continued longevity. Some attempts are finally being made to, in, undertaken to make genre products, more, projects more inclusive with more diverse characters to match the diversity of the audience, although there's still a lot of work to be done there. It's not so difficult to understand why all of this is happening. Yes, instant communications and sharing, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff go a long way. But underlying that is that the first generation of fans, often the shy, quiet ones who kept to themselves, now control the bully pulpit. They are the writers and directors and Hollywood executives who are making movies and television series that they want to see. And guess what? In many cases, the public does too. They are the storytellers and scriptwriters and artists who have helped break through the comic book graphic novel demographic barrier. You read comic books? No, well, they're graphic novels. Oh, okay. <laughs> and quite importantly, they are the journalists and bloggers and social media hounds who keep us fans pumped up and wanting more of practically everything. Star Wars fandom may start with the property, but it ends up being all about the people. Thank you. And now Angie makes her way up and we're gonna, we're gonna chat. <laughs> Leslie's also the person who's going to type your questions into the computer so I can see them up here. And Ron is collecting questions right now. If you want any, uh, any contribution into our Q&A, just hold up your question, just like so, sir. Thank you. And uh, we'll make sure to get them in here. I have to get back online, and then we can talk. You testing, have, testing. <laughs> you have the joy of a guy in his dream job. You yes, <laughs> yes, I do. And th th there are lots of people who have said over the years, you know what, I, 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 would, I would come work for you for nothing. And I said, well, that's about what I would get from you, I think, you know. Everybody needs to survive. Um, and every job is a job, but there are things about what I have done in my life that have been totally joyful and especially the last 15, 17 years with Star Wars. Were you having this much fun when you were in journalism? This much fulfillment, let me say. Um, fulfillment, no. Um, fun, yeah. I mean, it was great being a journalist. It was great being in Los Angeles. I was known as, uh, as the go-to guy because LA had this way of being, um, 
the place of riots, mudslides, fires, earthquakes, floods, and so, um, yeah, there was always that adrenaline flowing, um, and we had a bureau at its maximum of 18 people, and, and that's where I began to see myself as sort of an Obi-Wan Kenobi as a mentor, and I enjoyed that job you know, a lot, but total fulfillment, no, it was much more fulfillment working with fans and working at Lucasfilm. I really like the narrative of the rise of the geek. It's been fun to live through it. It's been fun to see that happen. Um, there was an era once upon a time when one of the most popular things you could be was a writer. Writers were revered like superstars, and then that kind of fell away, and we started seeing, for lack of a better word, maybe shallower role models or less fulfilling role models. And the geek You're talking about the Kardashians? <laughs> Well, I wasn't going to bring that up, but, um, but you know, one of the things about Star Wars that I think is a little less discussed, it, it appeals to an even larger pool of people. I was by no means a geek kid. I was a bit of an intellectual. I was not a geek. Didn't get Star. Didn't, didn't get science fiction or fantasy. I tried to read The Hobbit. And went, Bleh. but I remember, 16 years old, Star Wars came out. I went to go see it because it sounded like a fun movie, and I went home saying. Mom, you had to see this girl, called her a girl. You had to see this girl in there. They didn't care that she was pretty, she was really strong, and she told the guys to shut up. And it, it does teach, uh, it reaches people on a lot of different levels, yeah, not just I, geek. I, I, think, I think the role that, that Leia played in Star Wars was a very important one because here was, it went against mythology, which was the princess in distress, the princess who had to be rescued, and, and Leia's line, this is some rescue. I mean, really says she was, she was the one who was the brain, who became the brains of the outfit. And she was the one who helped lead them to safety. And, um, and then she becomes head of, you know, part of the, the, the lead of the rebel uh, alliance. So um, yeah, that was, uh, that was a very clever switch in the mythology. And that's what led a lot of girls to start liking Star Wars. And, and sort of broadening that appeal. Was that a deliberate turning on its head of the cliche? Because when you first saw her, okay, obviously the guys are falling in love with a very vision of her. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. She was almost set up as the desperate pretty thing that right. needs to be helped. Right, yeah, no, I think that was a very deliberate, uh, a very, yeah, that was, that was there from the beginning that Leia was really the strong one. It played against type. Uh, one of the questions from the audience, do you know the background behind why Lucas shifted the force from a mystical thing in the first three films to that of uh, symbolic, oh, pardon me, symbiotic biological relationships in the newer trilogy? And P.S., I think you were awesome. <laughs> okay, can I answer just that last sentence? <laughs> okay, so this is the, this is the big fan debate. The, the force seemed to be a mystical object, and we all love that, and then... George felt that he needed to explain what the force was in more detail in episode one. And so he came up with this thing called midichlorians, which is really sort of based on real world mitochondria, which is the you know, very small uh, cells in, in the body that carry the DNA. And George's explanation is, uh, well, that was, that was always part of my idea of what transmitted the force, but it, no, it doesn't take away anything from what the force actually is, but it just sort of explains why some people have it and other people don't. And so uh, as we got farther away from episode one and that, that whole... Um, explanation and midichlorians and you notice that didn't come up in episode two or episode three I think I'm much more comfortable with the force being something that is unusual and and does bind the galaxy together and and it's not just in humans but it, it, it as Yoda says it, it binds the whole universe together so um, why he wanted to do there were a lot of there were a lot of things that George did in episode one that um, that were sort of surprising and um, and uh, George is his own man he always has been and um, he 
wrote and, and directed what he wanted to write and direct. Speaking of things that divide the fans, um, the reworking of Star Wars for different tech effects and you know, different looks, et cetera, that has real pros and cons amongst the fans. I think the main problem with, that fans have had has been with one scene. And then it's been extended to, to other things. But um, in, in the original theatrical Star Wars, it was very clear that Han Solo shot Greedo in cold blood. Well, let me posit this question to you. Here you have a creepy bounty hunter sitting across from you who basically tells you that even if you get the money, he is going to kill you. And so are you going to let him get a shot off first? Um, no, of course not. And then sort of PC comes in. What's politically correct? And even Steven Spielberg, in one re-release of E.T., um, towards the end of the movie, when the kids on the bikes are, you know, they take off after the FBI is trying to stop them, and the FBI originally had guns in their hands, and Steven changed the guns to communications devices, and there was a howl, and Steven said, you know, you guys are right, and I shouldn't mess with my own pictures, and I never will again, and changed it back to the original for the next release and the, and the Blu-ray release. George has a feeling that um, he, he was always frustrated with Star Wars, that the technology wasn't there to go far enough, and so while he was changing things, he changed lots of things. Now, if you'll notice, since the special edition, if you rewatch the Han Greedo scene in every VHS, DVD, and Blu-ray release, and if you can measure the number of frames between Greedo getting the shot off first and Han and missing and Han shooting, the number of frames has slowly gotten less and less, and it's almost touching. So it's almost simultaneous now, just about simultaneous. There's like three or four frames. And so I think, I think George heard and George listens. And um, I mean, George, George has the courage of his convictions, but I think he also, you know, understands, you know, okay, well, maybe it was a lot closer than that. And maybe, maybe when I changed it, it was, it was like too much. Um, I, I've never asked him that question, but I... I'm, I'm, I'm just absorbing the, well, I never asked George that, but... <laughs> uh, there's some things you ask George and some things you don't, so... Well, how different is his role going to be uh, in, in, what, with, with the Disney takeover? And I know, notice he's listed as a creative consultant on yeah, Star and, Wars Episode Seven. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, George, George before George sold um, Lucasfilm to Disney, um, he uh, had worked on a, an extensive treatment of what the next three episodes could be, and that was one of the things that convinced Disney to buy the company, that they had a solid treatment and really liked the story. And then as, as Kathleen Kennedy has said, you know, George is there, um, you know, if we have any questions about, well, would a Jedi do this, or w could this happen? Or, you know, George is very happy to talk about it. But I think, you know, George has also decided that it's time to pass along Star Wars to uh, another generation of filmmakers. He is very comfortable with Kathleen Kennedy, who he's known for decades, and has worked with on Indiana Jones, and she is one of the most skilled producers in Hollywood. Um, to have Star Wars uh, under her, and then hiring J.J. Abrams and um, you know a bunch of, of really good writers, and, and it was just announced that Larry Kasdan is doing a, a and J.J. are doing a rewrite of the script that Michael Arndt has done. So I mean, you have all these things going for it. I think George has a 
a very high comfort level that he's left Star Wars in good hands and is, is really not going to be very involved in it. He's, he's got a museum he would like to build. Inside the industry, it must still be quite a feather in your cap to say, oh yeah, I'm going to be working on the script for the next Star Wars film. I think, um, well, I think the fact that you know, somebody like Lawrence Kasdan, who has done so many other things in his career, but you know, still is revered by fans for, um, for co-writing um, or really writing what is today Empire Strikes Back, um, um, you know, tells you a lot that he, that he still has a, a great deal of love for Star Wars and is uh, very happy to come back into, into the Star Wars saga. And he is also, uh, he is also writing uh, one of the spinoff films. So Disney has announced five films in five years starting in 2015. So episode seven, then a spinoff film on a character, then episode eight, then a spinoff film on a character, then episode nine. So, oh boy, lots of Star Wars to come. That actually knits in with one of the audience questions asking your personal thoughts and feelings and predictions under Disney. Anything you'd like to add to what you've already said? Well, I'm very comfortable with, uh, with Disney taking over. If there was any um, company that could take over Star Wars that I had a good feeling about, it would be Disney. And I think uh, based on what they've done with Pixar and based on what they've done with Marvel so far um, and the long working relationship that Disney and Lucasfilm have had because of the Star Tours rides, Indiana Jones uh, attractions, um, at, at one point uh, um, George really working with them to develop even more attractions at the parks, but because of financial issues, that didn't happen at the time. Um, George has always loved Disney. And George was in line the first day that Disneyland opened to the public in 1955. He took his very first flight as an 11-year-old kid uh, a former neighbor had moved down close to Disneyland and he was there on opening day and fell in love with Disney and just kept going back, um, went back with his family and went back with his kids and just, um, you know, just, just had this love of Disney and then, and then worked together very closely with Disney on the attractions. When Star Wars first came out, there were a lot of critics who said, now this is the kind of movie that Disney should be releasing. This is an all family movie. Disney since Walt's death in 1966 had fallen on really bad times and just couldn't seem to find its way and that's why so many people thought, hmm, that should have been a Disney movie. In your own experience, since you've joined this universe, uh, what's your favorite experience that came out of nowhere and you could not have predicted happening? Oh my goodness, my favorite experience. God, there are a lot of them. Um, uh, being on the set of, uh, of episodes one, two, and three for about a week each, uh, leading the editors of the fan magazines and in their interviews for background stories. Um, that was a thrilling experience, uh, seeing George actually filming and uh, being there and watching him make uh, creative decisions and um, um, you know, meeting, meeting the actors, uh, but, but just watching the filmmaking process was very exciting for me and I just, I never really expected that. Yeah. Uh, getting down to the specifics on some of the films, uh, do you have a preference on the costumes from the originals versus the prequels? On the costumes? Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, you know, obviously George decided that the prequels took place in an era where things were more opulent and uh, the galaxy was sort of at peace and so the design was a, a, lot, a lot different. By the time of the classic trilogy, the war had started, things had deteriorated, there was no, there was no money in the galaxy, everything was used. I, I love that look, that really sold the movie to me. I think when you look at some of the costumes that uh, Trisha Bigger designed for the, um, for the prequels though, I think it's a, 
a, a sin that the Academy never even nominated her for best costume design and, and ridiculous. Um, but um, there's always been this friction between George and Hollywood and, uh, and sometimes that, that, that works against some of, the, some of the people like that. So I love the simplicity of, um, of some of the costumes from the, the classic trilogy. Um, you know, the Tuscan Raider, for example, but then you look at what Trisha designed for the Tuscan Raider females for episode two, and you go, wow, because she took the basic look of the male Tuscan and did this amazing, it just seems so right. And so, you know, it would be really hard to choose between the two. When it comes to the awards, whether it's for costumes or writing or anything, science fiction and fantasy tend to have a difficult time. I, I, a huge fan of Meryl Streep, but granted, she's got an advantage when she's playing a, a real person in a real world, having a real crisis, and for some reason, no matter how well done, science fiction doesn't appeal to those awards committees. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing that, um, that Lord of the Rings sort of broke the, the, the mold when, it, when the last movie won an Oscar for Best Picture, but you know, to try to get uh, an award for an actor, um, you know, Star Wars, the original Star Wars, won seven Oscars. It didn't win for Best Picture or Best Director, and none of the actors won for Best Actor or Supporting Actor. Um, I've hated Woody Allen ever since because of <laughs> Annie Hall, but th that's beside the point. Um, but it is, I mean, and, 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 but Hollywood is, uh, is clearly taking note of the tentpole movies that sustain the business. It's just that then you get some incredible, these kinds of movies don't tend to have the juiciest roles for actors. And I think that, that's what we're seeing is that, that you can't probably win an Oscar as an actor in, in these kinds of movies, but as Lord of the Rings showed, you can possibly win for best movie. How has the job of the actor changed on set with the evolution of the Star Wars films? I, I imagine in the very beginning there wasn't as much acting on green screen, for example. No, I mean, in the, for the classic trilogy, there was, uh, there was very little uh, blue screen or green screen. There was certainly some, and you, you know, in, you know, Han Solo in the cockpit and everything, that, that wasn't really hyperspace. <laughs> Although it was a pretty good simulation in the Millennium Falcon ride, so um, I highly suggest if you come back and get a ticket for that. Um, it makes it more difficult for actors, I think, um, to act against blue screen or green screen, especially if they are not acting against another actor, but acting against nothing. Like, you know, if you're having a scene just with Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> so you do the rehearsal and you have the stand-in who is, who is Jar Jar Binks, and so you know the eye lines and, you, and you're reacting to the lines and everything, but then the actual filming takes place and you're, I mean, you have to be a really good actor. And I mean, not only know where your eye lines are, but you know, you're reacting to something that's not there. And then we have the whole, you know, the whole question of you know, actors like uh, Gollum. And I mean, and, and the very real question of, you know, is that, is that an acting performance? Should that be up for an Oscar? And I think it should be because that's acting, and what we're doing is just changing the interface. We're changing the way it looks, but you know, that's that's certainly acting. But it 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 is different. Mm -hmm. It is definitely different. Is there an item here in the Tech Museum exhibit? Since you brought up the Millennium Falcon ride, is there an item here in the exhibit that you would like in your collection? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Since this, is, uh, since this is the last stop, I'm just going to suggest to the archives, if I think they're really crowded with stuff now, that I would really be happy. You know what I keep getting attracted to is that Tuscan woman costume. I just, there's something about it that is intriguing to me that, that, that looks fantasy, and yet it, it, it's so much of Star Wars. It, it, it looks like it could be real, but it, it has that other galactic look to it, which is why I think parts of Star Wars work so well. 
but I wouldn't mind having the big Millennium Falcon model. That would be cool. George, are you listening? <laughs> so you don't have the inside string on all of this. You can't just say, well, I'd like that. Please, you, know, you know, you know, nobody, nobody can. I have like 300,000 plus pieces of stuff in my collection. I have been spending my money for 36 years on Star Wars stuff. And, and I love it, and, and, and you know, like 1% of the collection is on display, and that's still thousands of pieces. Um, but uh, nobody can have it all, and there are lots of fellow collectors out there who have some great stuff, and, um, and for the most part, we're all friends, and we help each other, and there's no backstabbing, and, um, and it's a it's a great it's a great community, but uh, you know I got to be truthful. George has the best collection. <laughs> well, in terms of, of what a fan can collect, there's an interesting twist at the Forbidden Planet in London, which it's it's a cult store. They call themselves the Cult Collection Store, and you can buy Doctor Who collectibles, but you don't know which one you're buying. They're plain unmarked box. I. I wonder about, as a merchandising choice, it's kind of odd. It's a, it's a tradition that started in Japan many years ago, and it's the whole blind box phenomenon. And so if you're, col you're a collector and there are 12 items in a collection, Disney does it now a lot, or 20 items in a collection. And it's, it's, basically, um, it's basically forcing you, if you have to have it all, to buy a lot more than you would need to buy if you were just buying the set of 12. You may have to buy, oh God, how many, how many boxes did I buy once to get like 20 figures from Disney thing? I mean, about 40 boxes. And then I try to figure that out based on, okay, well, if I wait till somebody on eBay sells the full collection, and uh, it's crazy. So as a collector, I do not like that at all, but I understand from a merchandising standpoint. I'll tell you, I'll tell you w w the original name back in Japan, back in 78 when they were selling Star Wars trading cards, large Star Wars trading cards, and they were in these like booklets, and, and each card was in, these, these were like three by five, and each card was in a, a gray paper wrapper, and you paid your five yen, 10 yen, whatever it was, and then you pulled one from the book, and it was called a gamble card. Well, it was a gamble as to what you would get. And there were also some of the cards would have, you know, you'd be able to trade back in for, you know, two yen or something like that. Of course, those are the cards that you keep because those become much more valuable as collectibles because everybody has traded them in for the money. So, um, yeah, I but hate it. Hate it, hate it. <laughs> Let me cheer you up, I'll give you a good question. Uh, how has Star Wars, the series of films, influenced diversity in films? Influenced diversity in films? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure it's had much of an effect. I think every film uh, and every filmmaker um, looks at diversity uh, on their own. If you're, if you're talking about diversity as far as types of films, that obviously opened up um, a, a lot of avenues for science fiction and fantasy. Um, uh, George is accused of ruining the industry by, by some because, you know, the, the summer popcorn movie, well, really, that Star Wars was not the first, Jaws was, so let's blame Steven <laughs> for making a wonderful movie and Star Wars for being a wonderful popcorn movie. It's, it's a fun summer movie. Now, is Hollywood making too many of them? Well, the box office is gonna determine that. And the good ones are gonna rise and the not so good ones are gonna fall. I mean, people aren't stupid. They're not gonna pay money for movies that you know, haven't grabbed them or haven't gotten good buzz. And um, if you're talking about diversity as far as, uh, as, far as um, the kind of people who play roles and, and things. I, th I think Hollywood is still having some problems with that. And I think, uh, I, I think they're, they're moving slowly in that respect, but you know, it affects the executive ranks of Hollywood too. There aren't enough women in top roles in Hollywood. Um, uh, there aren't enough people of color in top roles of Hollywood. And that affects what kind of movies get made too. So. Well, in fact, one of our guests here wants to know about the Bechtel test, and the Bechtel test is whether two women 
in a film will talk about something other than the guys. And she wants to know about whether they're conscious making that in the Star Wars films. Or he may want to know, pardon my assumption. I'm trying to think of two women talking in the Star Wars films. <laughs> Which says good. something. There aren't a lot of women in the Star Wars films. So, I mean, who is in the original trilogy? Leia. But she is one strong son of a gun. Who is in the prequels? Well, Leia's mom, um, Amidala. And she is another very strong personality. I mean, when you get elected queen at the age of 14, well, I still can't wrap my head around that. I mean, <laughs> but it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting concept. So George's women are strong. There may not be a lot of them in the films, but they are, they are strong women. Do you think that, that that's something people are aware of, that there aren't that many women in the films, in the creation of the new ones? I, you know, I think it, de it depends on the story. It really, it really depends on the story. I mean, you see, you see some, um, some fantasy films that, that have a number of female roles, and you see, you see a number that don't. Um, Star Trek was always very good uh, with some strong female roles. Uh, on TV, and then um, maybe a little less so in the in the movies. But um, I, I think Gene Roddenberry was was very alert to that and diversity, and you know, very early on in in the late '60s, as far as uh, people of color and race and and ethnic origin, and really, you know, that was the future. That was the Star Trek future. Was, yeah. uh, Clone Wars was one of the few real serious missteps in terms of success for the whole franchise, and it's still an incredible batting average. You're right; there's still incredibly, you know, more great movies than not. But what were the takeaway lessons from the beating that that film took? Um, I'm not sure which film you're talking about: Episode Two uh, or the animated. The, the animated. Okay. Right. Well, I think. I mean, there's an interesting story there. George um, decided to make a TV series and then got so excited by what he saw that he made the decision, well, this would be a good way to premiere the series is to basically take three or four of the episodes and combine them that were a story arc and combine them and put them on the big screen. And in retrospect, these were not the strongest episodes. When you look at what the Clone Wars became in seasons three, but especially seasons four and five as a TV series, it is some of the most amazing animation, the quality of the animation, the stories got darker. I mean, it was, it's an excellent series. I think we all agree that, or at least I think, I shouldn't say we all agree, yeah, I think that that the movie was probably a misfire and probably turned a lot of fans off of the Clone Wars for the first season, but it was just merely, you know, it's like a lot of TV, the Big Bang Theory, which so many of us love, just actually really didn't get to where it is now as one of the most popular series on television until like the second and third season. And I think that same thing happened with the Clone Wars. It just, they learned, they got better, the stories got better, the animation got better, the everything got better. So um, yeah, the Clone, Wars, the Clone Wars was not the most successful project that was put out by Lucasfilm as a movie, but the series I think uh, speaks for itself and is, is pretty fantastic. And uh, I, for one, am looking forward to the release of the last episodes, which, you know, which are, I understand are quite a few, um, that will, Dave Filoni has promised, come out sometime next year in some format. Um, so we will see uh, a bunch of episodes that would have been part of season six. Uh, this is actually the first question that came in, but I love it so much for the last question. So your last question, with everything what an incredible life and career you've gotten into here. Do you still have a personal holy grail? <laughs> I made the mistake once in the very first interview I gave about my collection. It was for Starlog magazine and it was in 
oh, the mid to late 1980s. And they said, so what's your holy grail? And I said, well, you know what? I really regret passing on a return of the Jedi kid's bicycle at Toys R Us. It was like $60, mint in the box. Darn, I wish I had bought that. So a couple months later, the article comes out. And within a week, I get a call from a dealer on the East Coast and a dealer on the West Coast. And guess what? It was my lucky day. They had access to a mint in the box Return of the Jedi Kids Bicycle from four years before that cost 60 bucks at Toys R Us and they would sell it to me for only $2,000. <laughs> Each of them had the same, I mean, it was like bizarre. And so I have never revealed again <laughs> what my holy grail is. And, and tell the truth, I, I, really, I really don't have one now. Um, what I collect most and what turns me on the most are fan-made items and art. Because fan-made items and art show the skill, but also the passion that artists and fans have for Star Wars. So some of my favorite pieces I've acquired, like a, a Bantha pinata from a fan in Mexico, or an R2-D2 made of popsicle sticks and tongue depressors and bent wood. Um, just that kind of stuff amazes me because I don't have very much in the way of artistic skills. Right before we took, we took part of the Rancho Obi-Wan to Germany for the big Star Wars uh, convention there a few months ago, and right before I left, I got this box shaking from the UK and I opened it up and there was this letter inside from this guy who doesn't have an email address. I finally got a letter back to him. And it's filled with these little Star Wars figures. And I'm like, what the heck? Well, they, he called them corkatures. And he collects champagne corks and carves them out with a scalpel and then uses wood putty to sort of add the outside and then puts little holes at the top so they're salt and pepper pots or salt and pepper shakers, as we would call them. And so now I have 20 Star Wars corkature salt and pepper pots. <laughs> and they're wonderful. And, and, you know, that's the kind of stuff that excites me these days. Yeah, anybody can go out and buy this stuff if you have enough money. And you, you can buy the action figures. You can buy, you, can buy, you know, $2,000 sculptures. But what excites me is the fan-made stuff and, and stuff that you never would think about. Yeah, that's the fun. That's the fun for me. Thank you very much. This has been great. My pleasure, Angie. Thank right. you. Thank you for coming out today. Good to have you here. We'll see you next time.